I, I can't even believe how fast Mondays come. Every it's, week. It yep. seems like just <laughs> the, uh, yeah, it seems like yesterday that we got done and I mixed it and I, same mess. same day every week. Yeah. It's crazy. Hey, uh, we're powering speed. 908-751-0211 if you want to call in. Tad. Like us on Facebook and iTunes and share us a bit too. Get to I don't know who's going to do it. You you can't make the show. Well, you're knows. talking before. You might introduce our guest. So I don't know if it's going to be before or after. So. Yeah, it'd be after you. Mm-hmm. I can't yeah. take this. I know. I can't. I I wish people could understand what goes on in here. That's why we got to have cameras. I told you that. Um, yeah. So we have a, a couple of special guests here. Uh, my two friends, two of my friends from uh, Dubai, um, Saeed El Morzuki and Mohammed Ahmed. They they. Flew in just for the show. Yeah, big fans. The 14-hour flight. <laughs> Autograph <laughs> session later. Yep. No, these guys were in doing some business in Indy, and then they came to visit uh, me You know, at, at my place of business. and So they wanted to come see the studio and sit in. Well, they took the pictures already, so they know what it's like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so say hello to, to your fans, boss. Hi, uh, boss. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you and to join this uh, two hours uh, Thanks a lot for this uh, opportunity. No, it's great. No, great. Great to have you. Great to have you. It's Because uh, there's a, a huge car culture over there. Huge. Yes. Uh, I mean, like, I, I'm i shocked. The the two places uh, in those regions and Australia. Yeah. Nuts. Both are big. And uh, so, you know, just to put some context to it, uh, you know, I've talked about the custom show over there that I go to every year. Yep. Well, Saeed manages that whole show. Okay. L- literally the whole show. Gotcha. It would be like, for you guys that don't know what the custom show is, it's like SEMA in the Middle East. And it's a very big show. It's very impressive. And he's the big boss. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's pretty cool. He's very humble, but he <laughs> everybody knows he's the big boss. He's good on the mic, so. Yeah. So, great show. I would encourage everybody to, to go there, but it's <laughs> a long ride for us, too. Mm. So. I, I'd like to get there. I'd, I'd you like, should get there one year. Yeah, I'd like to get there. I think it'd be fun. I mean, they came here, so you you kind of have to. Is that how that works? That's how it works, man. That's how it works. So we got some. Uh, we have a good guest tonight. Actually, you got somebody calling in uh, about a race somewhere, right? Yeah, the uh, team two six zero guys, and you have to say it that way because oh, yeah. God forbid you say two sixty. Oh, did I tell you I got seven three two racing? No, did you really? Yeah, I, well, I thought we should have something, but I'm not seven three two. Well, yeah, but I am. Okay. Uh, so. Well, um, then I'll get 908 drag or something. Yep. Those guys have a race coming up. Uh, it's called the Neglection Race. Yeah. And it actually looks like a really cool race. It's a racetrack that's been abandoned. Uh, nobody's been on it. You know, not prepped, not taken care of. And they're just essentially going there and opening the doors and racing. Blowing it off and racing. Yep. So that ought to be pretty neat. So they're going to call up. And I mean, we, we that's want- That's like next weekend, I think. It is. Uh, they're going to talk about it because there's some, so you know, some potential weather in the area. Oh boy. Yeah, and that always sucks. I mean, you just can't plan around that stuff. But yeah. I mean, we like to promote this type of racing. I'm, sure. I mean, all of it. And I'm not taking anything away from NHRA, but this is stuff like we can kind of all, excuse me, like relate to. Yeah, it's entry level. Real, yeah. real people. Real people. Know, doing, real cars. Doing cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Station wagons. Yeah, like Jason. He. uh he, he had a nice little thing. He should call in, too. I'm not even going to get into his thing. I want him to call in at some point. Yeah. We got to talk to him again, too. Jason Dozier um, had a very good outing this past weekend. So good for him. All the stuff filters by on Facebook when I'm not really looking at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we also have uh, uh, Mike McGinnis from Cobb Tuning later on. He's their uh, one of their R&D calibrators. I've known Mike for many years. I'm excited to talk to him. And I'm sure Paul Yo will appreciate the fact that you said calibrator. Oh, yeah. Isn't that what Calibrator. they're called? Well, tuner. T-O-O-N-E-R. Uh, well, yeah, some of them call them tuners. <laughs> yeah. They, this uh, th- this is quality guy. Uh, people wanted more tech stuff. You know, Tom and I have been talking, you know, throughout the day. What are we going to ask him? You know, how are we going to approach this? Because you can't ask the guy to give you knowledge of calibration start to finish in you know, right. a half hour or 40 minutes. Yeah, way, way too complex. And then, and, and secretly, which is not going to be secret now, Mike and I didn't want to sound like idiots asking them, you know, stupid questions. So, uh, we discussed some stuff and we, we have some good ideas and, um, you know, not like we're going to try to stump him or anything. Cause I don't think we could anyway, but we do have some good topics for him to, uh, to talk about. I think the guys will be interested. And I don't know how many people have seen the Facebook, um, 
post from, uh, I guess, did Paul do that post about our upcoming lineup? Yeah, I yep. guess, Paul's since, the one to put it up. I guess since Paul, since Paul took over the scheduling <laughs> of the show. Yeah, I saw that, and I was like, you know, um, Tom, maybe uh, maybe Paul's got to do yeah, this. No, he, he gets shit done. I give him credit for does, that. He does get shit done. No, he's a cool guy. Um, but yeah, we have some very, very high-end um, calibration specialists that I, I've been talking to for the next several weeks, so it'll be good. Okay. Well, we actually have uh, Adam from Team 260. Hang on a minute. Yo, man, what's up? Hey, how you doing, guys? What's up, Adam? All right. Yeah, I think Nick Nick is on here too. Cat, we yep, interviewed the team. There he is. Yeah. Yeah, you took two six zero guys. Love the three way, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're yeah. That's only West End Wall. We don't get into that. <laughs> well, you're in it now. Uh, we are on suicide watch, though. At this point. <laughs> yeah. So, what exactly is going on? It looks like the weather might be uh, less than cooperative. Yeah, Mother Nature hates us. So. Yeah. It was no good here this weekend. So we're like, we could deal with like a 10% chance or something, but it's 90% chance of rain on Friday and I think 60% on Saturday. Yeah, and we we were going down there yesterday and I, I looked at the weather forecast for the first time and it said, oh, so, you know, maybe a, a few sprinkles both mornings. We're like, we're not racing till afternoon. We're all good. We get up today, we start hitting promotion hard and then look at the forecast and it's like a, a kick in the nuts. Gotcha. So if things uh, if things aren't going to work out, what are you going to do uh, the the following weekend, or is it a whole you know different date to reschedule? A whole different date. It looks like um, there there's another big race locally next weekend um, that we, that we'll be at to support some other guys uh, that are in the area. So it looks like it's probably going to be we have a, a date maybe the last weekend in June or the last weekend in July. Gotcha. So we were thinking maybe July fourth weekend. Yeah, that's which I think that yeah, I think that's the last weekend in June. It's kind of like that first weekend of the July. Oh, season. okay, okay. Well, all, all all you can do is hope for this weekend. But yeah, I guess it doesn't look real good. No, but you know maybe that gives us time for you guys to come out and hang with us. By then, you know, get that uh, Corvette <laughs> going. Get the cathedral heads on there. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because we were we were doing some uh, some data. Today, we're going through some data and crunching some numbers, and I think we figured out, and Mike had his hand in this, and you, you all know how smart he is. Um, we think if we put a set of Cathedral Port heads in the passenger seat, it's got to be good for a tenth. Easy. <laughs> it's got to be. It depends, it depends on the multiplier you're using to come up with your fictional numbers. Hey, they might not be fictional, man. Those heads, you know Cathedral Port. It's all of it. We're going to get a lot of mileage out of this one. Oh, oh yeah. This is this, this is, is never going to end. No, never going to end. <laughs> well, it's because we're right. So. No, it's not going to end. Exactly. So uh, I guess uh, when are you guys planning on actually canceling or did you already? Well, we, we didn't officially yet. We will have to by tomorrow, it looks like. Um, the, Brent, the owner of the track, you know, there's quite a few things he has to get in order for the weekend that we don't have it figured out early in the week either leave him hanging on the hook or or don't give us enough time to get him done and so i think tomorrow if, if we unless we wake up in the morning and and everything's done about a 180 on us then we will probably have to reschedule okay well look we we definitely want you guys to keep coming back and promoting stuff like this uh, you know we've got chewy from the west coast we've got all kinds of people we want to promote so yep. Yep. you know if we can help we certainly will so tell everybody where they can get the information about the race so they can keep on top of it yeah, they can go to our, our webpage at team260racing.com, and there's a link in there for the neglection stuff. Um, also, you can find us on uh, Facebook at the Team 260 Racing on Facebook or Team 260. Uh, under the event area, there's the racing event page. So all that will be on there. Um, Nick and I's personal page is on Facebook, uh, Adam Hobson, Nick Taylor, so you can find we're always on there updating things also. Yeah. Also, we got we were both on Instagram too, and we do have a Team Two Six Zero Instagram also that we try to keep updated too. All right, perfect. So, all right, well, you guys, that might be if uh, can I plug the monthly one real quick? Too? Sure, yeah, but because it's not this, I was just going to say this is not the only one you guys do. This is just this one. Correct, and and yeah, so this this happens to be the no prep version of what we do. Then we have the full prep, the real deal. Just you know nice prep track that happens uh, once a month at Muncie on Fridays. It's all street car stuff. And uh, last Friday was our latest one. And 
and it was great. I mean, a lot of people there, a lot of fast cars. The track was insane. The track was, I think Wesley, he was, Wesley was backing me up at one point. I, he almost fell over multiple times because the track was so sticky. Yeah. And then that same pass I put on the bumper, so it, the track is there. Yeah. Wow. getting really good at prepping that track. Yep, for sure. So you guys run that event once a month? Yeah, yeah. correct, yep. <laughs> In Muncie, Indiana? That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. We should just go to that, just go to it. Yeah, we could. Yeah. Just like fly into somewhere. And How far is it from Indy? An um, hour and a half. We're just flying to there. Yeah. We'll take a helicopter. Helicopter, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys, well, I'll have to, maybe I can post um one of the, like the a couple of the videos over on your guys' page and check it out. I mean, it's really neat just to see the, the difference in, in street cars that we have there and kind of the diversity from, 1350 class cars, which are a lot of the stock Camaro, Mustangs, uh, Taurus, SHOs, Cherokees, um, all the way to the eighth mile classes, the, the unlimited eighth mile class, which are a lot of big, big tire, pro street kind of big block nitrous or, you know, blower cars that come out and race. So there's a lot of everything for everyone. Yeah, well, you can post anything you want on our, on our site and we'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll repost it or one of us will repost it. Yeah, you'll have to, I'm not any good at that stuff. And yeah. Tad is one step above useless half the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, sure. I have to figure all this crap out. <laughs> so, all right, guys. Well, look, keep us informed. Um, yep. you know, we'll, uh, we'll do the best when you got a new date. We'll, uh, we'll make sure we push it for you guys and, you know, hopefully it works out better if it doesn't clear up on its own, you know, maybe, maybe we'll get real lucky. Never know. Thank you. Watch the radar. Thanks very much for giving us the opportunity. Appreciate it. Oh, no problem. I Anytime, can't wait to guys. meet all you guys. It ought to be a blast. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Heck yeah. See ya. Thank you guys. See you, man. Later. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So we got some hatred on, on the, uh, not hatred, but we have some, uh, some stuff on the chat room already about theater port heads. Mm. So can you, you know, look. With the data to back it up. I, I don't the. Um, don't even get me started because this is, I know that's why half of them are doing that. That's why half of them are doing it. Well, Mogul's on there, you know, spewing. <laughs> or he started it, maybe. Whatever. But yeah. Whatever. So, Look, I, I said it before. I'll say it again. I'll say it every friggin' week. Anytime you guys want to duplicate that test, hit your pocket. I told you the pricing last week, what I would do it for. You agreed, Tom. You said yeah, it was good. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I don't have to do the test for me. I don't give a shit. I know I'm right. That's right. And if he's head, sure he's right. Head Games I'm... Dave says he's right. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he just said that. He can hit his pocket, too. Yeah, he says, because I'm right. hmm Whatever. Whatever. But you know what? No, it's funny. The the people, and I'm, I'm not including Dave in this group, but the people that are, like, uh, on the square port side. Yep. Um, from the experience level, I, I think that. <laughs> I think that just, you know, reputation and basic I know, knowledge. Man. I know. I know. But we're not going to get into all that. No, I guess we can't. <laughs> and I, I guess Mike from Innovative, our, our, our guest, uh, he's he's got two world records with Dave's heads, which I believe are in a Subaru because Dave, Dave's, you know, Dave's good at a lot of heads. Right up your alley, Todd. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Subaru guy over there. Yeah. Mike's got a, he, he's, he's had a very fast um, Subaru for a long time. I think it's, well, I think I know it's named Voltron and, uh, he does time attack stuff or type stuff. He did it up in Canada, in Buffalo area, wherever he used to race. And he always had records there, like always would crush everybody. Pretty cool. He's a good driver and it was a Subaru. So I shouldn't tool on this Subaru guys today. No, no, you can tool <laughs> on them. They can take it. So, um, what, what, Tad, what do you got, man? Anything? Well, I did figure something out from uh, next week is the pro mods at Island. Really? That we were all, you know, debating on uh, how can they shut down. I I totally forgot it. It's an easy way to make the shutdown an eighth mile longer. How's that? We're on an eighth mile track. Oh, is, is that, that what they're going to do? do? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what I was saying. <laughs> Island, there is no way. I mean, yeah, if you I, wanted to get great footage, go stand like past the catch fence with your phone. <laughs> come flying at you. Yeah. Yeah, about half of them. No, I'm ready to duck. Yeah. yeah, I was just looking down. It's a 499 index, you know, eighth mile and everything like that. It's like, oh, duh. That's yeah. how it's Yep. easy enough then. Makes much more sense. Much more sense. Still be pretty brutal though. That track's a little sketchy. Well, and I, I think the track itself is actually in pretty good shape from what I heard. That it's yeah, not, it always has been. Yeah, but just uh, not, not, a, not a good place to try to stop. No. 
especially with something at the at the quality of a pro mod. Mm-hmm. And we got Corvette news. Mm-hmm. We do. I don't know. Do we? No. I'm asking you. No. I mean, no more than we had. Okay. Well, well I mean, I don't know how much we talked about it. Um, we really didn't. It's being worked on. I'm waiting for dimensions for the intercooler cores. I'll get going to get them ordered. Uh, we're going to use, uh, I guess, I guess Bell is who we're going to use. Oh yeah, those the four inch ones or whatever they were. Those. Yeah, well, it's it's a real thick core. Yeah, yeah. And it's because this there's going to be some compromise here because there's only so much you yep. can put in these things. And yep. I don't I don't particularly want the intercooler directly in front of the radiator. So we're going to do some stuff a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and Tim was good enough to tell me that we can get a a sizable portion of weight out, um, from what he was telling me Yep. in the, in the nose of the car, which is kind of nice. So, you know, things are going, Yep. I got to talk to Howard, um, well, I'll probably get to talk to him off air and then we'll bring him on air at yep. some point to discuss the game plan. But no, things are uh, on my side. I can't do anything more. Yep. I'm just waiting. Yeah. I was just telling some, I, I was telling Howard, somebody asked for him to be on the show again. Uh, one of the, one of our listeners wanted to hear from him again. <clears throat> Yeah, well, I mean, he's. I, I know this. We can talk about what Howard's got going on. He moved into his new building. Yeah, where he's in. He was in the process of it. Actually, the other day when I talked to him, he was still doing it. Yeah, he's in. He's in. But okay. they are doing stuff, so they're getting it done. Um, what do you got, boss man? Me? Yeah. Anything? No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I wish I had something real exciting. Um, you know, it was my, it was Mother's Day on Sunday. Yeah, and my mom's birthday was on Saturday. Oh, so, you so had, you my had, whole weekend was kind of kind of goofy. So you had a lot of stuff going on. Okay, there's our well. There's two. I don't know. Top one. No idea. I mean, I, yeah, gone. Yeah, <laughs> easy enough. Yes. Yep. Okay, Mike, you are on the air. Oh, Mike's gone. I don't hmm. know what happened. Okay, he'll be back. We got somebody else here. Hold yeah. on a minute. Hello. Hey, what's going on, guys? What's up, Mike? You're, Mike, hang in there one second. We got a we got a caller right that came in right before you. This ain't Mike. Yeah, I know. I was telling. I, uh, I, I know Mike that. is on hold. Yeah, so he could hear that. So go ahead. What do you got? Hey, man, it's been forever since I seen like I call. This is Joe Dysinger from out here in Missouri. Oh yeah, I remember. What's up? Not much. Just figured I'd call him and let you guys know. Uh, just got done. We actually pulled a car of a basically out of the weeds from 13 years ago uh, that we used to race and did our first snow prep over the weekend uh, for the uh, Kyle Phelps Memorial Race here down at the local Larry Jeffers Race uh, Motorsports Raceway. And we had a pretty good time. First one out, small tire. We lost in the final due to a technicality, but all in all, it was a great time and great race, and they do it every year. Uh, is for one of the local guys. His son passed away, and all of it goes to a memorial fund for them. And like I said, it's just a great race. And, you know, anybody out next year that wants to come down, just, you know, look online and, and you can find it. But it, it's one hell of a race. Okay, fantastic. Here's what I'm going to do. Um, hit me up on the Facebook Messenger, and you can, if you can, get us in touch with the people that actually promote the race. Yep. So for next year, we can make sure we, we push some stuff. I'm not blowing you off, but... I'm not blowing you off, but Mike is on the phone, so we're gonna we're gonna bring him in. All right, cool. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. See ya. He's a good dude. Yeah, yes, Mike. Tom, how are you? Good, man. Good. Um, so as everyone knows, uh, I I think I said before, this is um, Mike McGinnis now of of Cobb Tuning. Uh, we've known each other quite a while, uh, from back in his days at Innovative Tuning, and he's gonna. He's going to hopefully teach us some stuff today. Um, should be a, an exciting, uh, informative session. So, uh, Mike, kind of tell everybody how we met and uh, how you got to you know where you are now. Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on, guys. Honored to be here, and uh, hope that I can shed some light on a few things. Um, uh, I started out into cars early two thousands. Um, first performance car was a Subaru WRX when they first came out and, uh, kind of out of necessity learned how to tune it because I couldn't find someone to do it for me. Um, grew through friends into deciding to turn it into a career 
And uh, in 2004, uh, I opened my shop, Innovative Tuning. Um, first just tuning cars and then quickly turned into a full service shop. Wow. When when you first got into the into the Subaru tuning, was there anything out there at that point in time to get you in? Or was that the thing like you had, Tad? What was U-tech. it, a U-Tech or yeah. whatever the thing was? U-Tech from Turbo XS. Yeah. So was that, that like, is that, was that your only option then? You know, that one wasn't even out when I got the car. Um, I True. got the real early ones, spring 2001. And uh, I think the first thing that I knew about, at least, that came out was the Unichip, which was a different piggyback, um, but you couldn't custom tune it. Yeah. It had CAN maps on it. Um, and, uh, I remember talking to some guys at car meets and they didn't seem too pumped on it, but when the U-Tech came out, that was the one that I got to. So you're literally a, a, a self-taught calibrator, I guess like most are, but well, not today, I guess there's a lot of, uh, a lot of information out on calibrating, but you started from kind of zero and worked your way through it. Yeah, I was always into computers, always interested in cars, and the two, you know, kind of came together with tuning. But at the time, as much research as I did, I, I just couldn't really find much. Um, I got a couple books that had some, some of the real fundamentals, um, but uh, there was a whole lot of trial and error um, for years before I started the shop. Wow. Um, well, you know, I, fortunately, I, I've known you for a while, and I know a little bit of the background, but... Um, so I know how successful you were um, at your shop in, in Buffalo, and uh, I want to get to, um, you know, today. Uh, so Cobb Tuning comes hunting for you because of what you've done and, you know, kind of um, people you've met along the way? Yeah, it kind of happened over a long period of time. Um, in 2005, when Cobb released their first uh, dealer tuning software um i was one of the guys that pre-ordered it and uh had a long relationship with them um always great working together and about five years ago um they were doing a dealer visit and uh one of the guys from cob uh, christian who's been there a very long time and i were hanging out just kind of shooting the shit at a place while we were getting dinner and uh in conversation it came up that um if uh, if I ever wanted to go for a change, they you know would love to have me, and it it stuck with me. Um, you know, it was something I thought about for quite a while. Hmm. And uh, just more recently, just as my kids got older, talking to my wife, looking for a way to improve my work life balance. Because when I have my own shop, I just I'm a perfectionist, and I just go go go, and uh, never take time off. So. Um, uh, recently, they had a calibration position open up and uh, investigated it again, and I guess everything just fell into place. So this all came from just working with Cobb and doing the tuning. And and forgive me, I'm not a Subaru guy, so uh, I, there's a lot of things I don't understand about it. Um, from from Cobb, when they first started, the access port is a handheld programmer that would that would give you the ability to change the programs or, or tell because you know most of the Subaru guys the, the non-Subaru guys listening aren't going to know these terms you, you know what I mean like access port sure, yeah yeah absolutely so they started out uh geez, it was before 2000 actually um before the WRX even came out in America which was the first factory uh, turbocharged car sold in large numbers except for a, a legacy back in the day and um, they were bench flashing them so bench flashing would be you take the ECU out of the car send it to the company um, and they can do it there but your car's apart you can't drive it while this is happening and you know while it was cool it was something that you could do um, generally speaking that's pretty inconvenient so um, Cobb comes out with this device the access port um, in the uh, early 2000s, which was pretty groundbreaking at the time, um, it could store several maps, um, several tunes, and the user could just plug it into the OBD2 port, push a couple buttons on the device, and change the tune on the car. And, you know, now today we think, well, you know, several companies have that for various things. You know, some of them have fancy color screens and this and that now, but um, this was of a big deal back then. 
Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, see, and, it, and it, it still kind of is a big deal yeah. how, how cool they are. Yeah, well, see, when I was, because like I've always heard you say it, and this is just me yeah. not knowing about Subarus, but like, and even even Tad wasn't 100% clear because he never had one. Right. Because I guess he had a UTEC. And That's then, a piggyback, yeah. Right, right. So now now I get it. So this is, the, the access port is essentially the tool that lets you interface with the computer, and then the tuning is another whole level. Of yeah, software yeah. that you you do the tuning and put it in the access port, and the access port puts it in the car. Well, I want I want to ask something specific because you know we always joke around about stage this and stage that <laughs> because you know coming from race engine backgrounds, we used to talk about camshafts in you know duration and ramp speed and stuff like that, and now everything is like yeah I got a stage two cam, but am I correct in saying that Cobb really started the stage stuff because you guys would figure out a tune on a car, and it's not only Subaru. But uh, on a car, like with a, uh, a a turbo, a different turbo and air intake and injectors and stuff, and it'd be like a can tune that would work if you use this part, this part, and this part, and you would call that like stage two. And if you did some, did more, like big cams or whatever, then it's stage three. Is that is Am I accurate there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know some markets like Nissan, they call it BPU, and they just add pluses on the end of it, depending on how many parts you throw in the car. You could end up with BPU plus, 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 or something silly. Um, and the name doesn't really tell you a whole lot about what's going on. Um, and uh, I think at Cobb, we're, we're guilty of that to some extent, but it's for a good reason. And the reason is um, the mod path, be the same on every car because the weak points of each car are different so for example if we're talking about uh ford mustang ecoboost um you know the intercooler on that car um becomes a restriction far before let's say uh a downpipe might on another vehicle so you know the first thing we do on all the cars is a tune because the tune alone is usually your best bang for the buck, especially on a factory turbocharged vehicle, which is uh, mostly what Cobb focuses on. Because, you know, for a few hundred to, uh, you know, up to a couple thousand bucks for some of the more expensive units, um, you get a lot more than you're going to get any other way. So we start with the tune, but then, you know, maybe the intake makes is the best way to get a little more out of the car. Maybe it's a downpipe, maybe it's an intercooler. And we have to do a lot of testing to figure that out because every car is just different. Yeah, sure. But but the point is, yeah, so you're saying your stage one or stage two for a Mustang is different than stage two for a Subaru or a Mitsu, which makes perfect sense because, like you said, intercooler on one is different than downpipe on another. But um, kind of stage, like the initial stage statement, came from you guys like uh i i i think you guys are the originator of that right i don't know if we're the first but um it's definitely a huge part of what we do um one of the big things at Cobb is we want to have uh complete solutions you know we want to provide the parts with the tune and the access port so they can put the tune on the car and in a couple couple hours you and your buddies in the garage can throw the parts on flash the map on the car, take it out and enjoy it, and know that we did all the hard part. You know, we figured yeah. out what's going to give you the best bang for the buck. We make sure all the, uh, the car runs right. And uh, it takes a whole lot of the guesswork out of it, um, which I think our customers definitely appreciate. Yeah, I mean, and let's face it, it works fantastically well for the factories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. they if you have a, a known set of variables that you're changing in the car and you know what you're changing them to, you know, you could have a really nice, yeah. drivable, reliable package. Yeah. I think that's great. Well, yeah. I mean, but now what happens is people talk about stages as a generic term. I know on everything. It's become a three quarter cam. Of, yeah, of exactly, the, uh, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I'm 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 going to make the proclamation that Cobb started the K, the the stage thing. Noted. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we can do that, but all right. So, um, well, let's ask some cool questions because you know Mike's um depth of knowledge in this in this deal is pretty pretty cool. So. Uh, you want to go first, Mike, or you want me to? What do you got? Uh, you know the the thing that we argued about a lot of times, and I and I mean, don't even get me started on all the crap that goes on 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 Facebook. Yeah, but like count. like, there's always the argument about what seems to be compression versus boost, uh, spooling versus compression, yep, turbo size versus engine displacement, and 
I mean, this, this uh, obviously this, there's a lot to this, and I've said this from day one. There's a lot of things about the turbocharging world I don't know because I never did it. Mm-hmm. So anything I've learned, I've learned like yesterday. Mm-hmm. But it it seems like when people talk about, you might talk to a Subaru guy, and he'll say, "Oh, got got to be ten to one. Can't can't not be ten to one." But then when you look at amazing cars from like factories that that use substantial amounts of boost they'll come from the factory at like nine to one, mm-hmm. you know, some of the, the supercars, hypercars, whatever classification you yeah. want to put them in. Yep. So from your experience, what, um, what, what's kind of the general rule on compression? Like, what is it? What is it? Or is there a general, is there rule? a general rule? Exactly. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think there's a few key components to that. Um, First one I think of is what fuel or fuels the car is going to get run on. Um, one of the reasons being, you know, we talk about any supercar, it's still a street car that's sold for street use and they expect people to put pump gas in the car. So there's only so much um, uh, they can do in terms of compression or boost um, before a relatively low octane fuel is going to knock. Um, so, um, yeah, that's the first big component of how you make that decision. Um, the next one for me is probably going to be how the vehicle is going to get used. So if you're, uh, let's say you're into drag racing, and in that case, you're probably not very concerned with low-end power. And when I say low-end, I don't mean low speed. I just mean low engine speed. Like, you know, you don't need full boost at 2,000 RPM to get down a drag strip well. So um, you're not super concerned about making the turbo the smallest possibly you can and barely hit a power goal. So um, when you can do that, you can use a turbo that's big enough that um, you don't need to run it out of compressor. Um, You can just let the turbo do the work. You don't need to uh, crank the compression up in the engine to get every last horsepower out because, you know, you know, I could just turn the boost up a pound and make another 10 horse. I don't need half a point of compression to do it for me. Well, see, and that, that's yeah. kind of always been my contention. And uh, here's how I looked at it. If somebody told you, hey, look, we can use any fuel, any fuel, we, we don't care what it is, and there is no boost lem- level, you know, re- restriction, like they don't tell you you can only run 20 pounds, uh, and they're, you're building this to make maximum power, what compression do you use? Because I, I mean, I just always look at this, that if you can tolerate detonation and let's say I know from say a typical V8 small block Chevy, if you went from nine to 10, you'll probably pick up somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 12 horsepower, like, or, or 12 foot pounds of torque, but whichever side you want to look at it on. I know it's a hell of a lot easier to make that with a boost knob than, than a point of compression. Oh yeah. So there's gotta be a point that's like considered a good point. And then on either side of that point, what's wrong? Uh, well, I got to believe it's got it's different in in every engine, you know, based on cylinder head and and uh, you know h- how efficient they are. Well, well, this is probably where the whole package thing comes together because if you have a, a small motor, like say Tad's, you know, legendary JDM two O motor, okay. if you have a little tiny motor and you've got a bigger turbo on it, it's probably harder to make it spool. So compression becomes essentially an aid to make the thing work. Well, let's get. What's your opinion on that, Mike? Oh, that's an interesting one. I mean, the, the compression certainly helps when you're off boost. Um, you know, when you're operating naturally as for it, essentially, if you're waiting for the turbo to get going, um, as you guys know, the compression is certainly going to make the car more peppy. Um, and, and anything you can do that builds more cylinder pressure is going to help build more exhaust energy, which gets the turbo going. So the two kind of, um, those two things kind of happen at the same time. You bump the compression up, you get more off boost power, you get more off boost uh, exhaust output that drives the turbo to get the turbo spooled. So um, that's definitely useful in a couple ways. But like you guys said, there's a point you get to where you bump the compression up so much that you have to turn the boost down so much just to keep the engine from knocking that now you're not making power. So um, there's a happy medium of both. Um, uh, unfortunately, there isn't a fuel that that's a magical unicorn fuel that, that totally prevents knock, but there's some that are pretty incredible. Um, you know, if you put nothing on the car, VP import, you can get away with an awful lot. And then those guys are probably running 
a lot of compression and a lot of boost. But for most guys out there, um, you know, they're trying to run maybe a V85, some 100 octane, and probably 93 some of the time. So they're probably not going to want to push the compression that far. And uh, then they can change the fuel of the track, run some extra boost, and it gives them a bit more flexibility, you know? Yeah. Now, yeah. speaking of that, I mean, it kind of leads into the conversation about detonation and everything else, yep. uh, the availability of flex fuel yep. with with your stuff. So that that's actually something new that we should talk about as well. Um, I, you want to talk about the, actually, if, if you know what, let's say flex fuel. Cause I, I personally know that Mike had, he was pretty involved in some of that, uh, some of the conversion stuff. Um, but back to what we're talking about now, um, you know, he said something interesting about the magic unicorn fuel and I know VP in for import and, you know, Q16 is crazy and uh, obviously straight methanol, but, uh, you and I have talked about, um, AFR and, and can you tell from AFR always what's going on in a cylinder. And, you know, Mike, you've done a lot of uh, R&D work uh, probably on this stuff, um, and I just don't know. So can you? Can AFR always tell you what's going on in a cylinder? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, um, these days, uh, if a tuner is going to ask someone to have one gauge in the car, um, that's probably what they're going to ask for, and it is super useful. Um, you definitely can't tell everything from it, but um, there's a couple things to keep in mind. One is, uh, for the most part, unless you're working with a V engine, people usually have one sensor that's reading kind of the average of what the entire engine's doing. If you got a V engine, you have one on each bank, you can see what the whole bank's doing. Um, if an engine you know, knocks on a single cylinder, pretty unlikely you're going to see anything happen on the wide band unless it's so severe that it's too late to do anything about it. Um, but uh, Well, that's actually a really good point. I mean, if there's some form of knock or, or detonation, does would the wide band actually show it? Like, let's say it was an eight channel or well, or a four channel, depending on how many cylinders you had. Yeah, wide band. That's what I was just going to say. Yeah. What if you had one in every? So let me rephrase the question: If you had one in every hole, uh, you know, is it is it magic? Well, uh, I think if I had the money to put one in every hole, um, I would probably put one per bank instead and make sure I've got good knock control and maybe add uh, an exhaust gas temp sensor or some pressure sensors, give me some additional info. But uh, on some engines, you know, let's say you've made like a custom intake manifold and custom exhaust manifolds, um, you could have accidentally caused a serious cylinder-cylinder airflow imbalance and individual wide band per cylinder is really um, the only way short of the flow bench testing of the entire assembly, um, the only way that you're going to see that. So um, if you're running like stock intake manifold, uh, common set of headers nobody seems to find quirks with, um, you probably get more benefit out of uh, maybe um, taking some time, um, dial in the knock control sensitivity, make sure that's good, just to have the one wide band per bank. Um, and then, like I said, maybe an exhaust gas temperature sensor or cylinder head temp sensor, just to make sure the temperatures aren't getting to the point where you're going to start melting engine components. Yeah, see, because that's what Tom and I were discussing uh, on the way, you know, coming into the show today, because he wanted, you know, he was curious, could you ever ascertain that there was a knock just from wideband? And I, I kind of told him no, because it wasn't fuel mixture dependent, it was event dependent. Mm. So I, I didn't think you'd ever see it. And that's what we got into EGTs and yep. of course later model the cylinder pressure gauges. I mean yep. that stuff is fantastic. What what they've come to be able to do. All right. Well, I mean, uh, I I told you I still I wanted eight sensors to everything and you was like stop. Yeah. You know you don't need to do that. Yeah, but now since I have the connection with Hendrick Motorsports, it looks like we're going to have them. So that might be cool. We'll see. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, so now uh, on to flex fuel. So you uh. uh I, I remember you telling me that um, you were pretty involved in some of the flex fuel um, development. Uh, where are you at with that? I mean, like, what did you do? Yeah, um, I mean, COP does some pretty interesting stuff where they add these really in-depth 
uh, functions to the stock ECU. Um, it's something that most of the other aftermarket uh, reflash blades buyers don't really get into. Generally, they expose um, what's already there in the, the factory tune, but not too many of them are designing their own stuff. So, um, like, I will add speed density to a car that was a map based tune and stuff like that. But the flex fuel is a really popular one these days um, just because E85 is getting more available. Everybody's really starting to understand the fuel, how they can use it to make more power. And uh, I've definitely wanted to get on board with that. So, currently, we've got flex fuel for the GTR um, and for a number of the Subaru platforms. Um, we're actually releasing flex fuel for a bunch more of the figures next week, uh, the 0407 STI, 0607 WRX. Um, and essentially, the way our flex fuel kit works, um, it's plug and play, kind of like the way we like to do everything, just to make it easy for people. Um, and you plug the sensor into the car. It lets the ECU know um, what the ethanol content of the fuel is currently. And then the tune is set up... Um, in a way that it blends between whatever the lowest ethanol content you want to tune to and the highest you want to tune to, and it, it blends between the two. So one thing a lot of people get confused about is they think, you know, flex fuel is like two tunes. It's one for gas and one for E85, but in reality, in order to do it right, um, we want to have settings in there for zero to 100% ethanol, and if somebody has E39 because, you know, they had three gallons of one thing and five of the other, and that's what it happened to work out to. We need the car to run right on that. Wow. So um, it blends between the two. Um, it does so on fill tables, timing tables, boost tables, everything you need to make the car run just right as if you uh, sat on the dyno and specifically tuned for, for that one ethanol content. Now, I would imagine that when you get to a point that once you have a certain amount of E85 content, that things must stabilize like ignition timing. Like there's probably a, a measurable benefit from this percent to this percent and this percent for this percent. Yeah, good probably point. once you're over a certain point, like I, I think that p slides you more to the other side. So my real question would be is if you were going to try to do calibration of a flex fuel vehicle, um, obviously you couldn't calibrate every 1%, but how many points do you have to get to blend all the maps together to make a smooth transition from one to another? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, since we're kind of in the, the performance aftermarket space versus the OE manufacturer side, um, we give the tuners more granularity than, than usual. Um, so, for example, I've got a uh, Cadillac CTSV with an LS2, and a, I put a Pro Charger on it. And um, when I get into the GM ECU, um, with a different software package, they only have, I want to say it's like three or maybe four breakpoints for this. Mm. So um, I have to do things a bit more linear. I, I can't be too creative. Um, but when Cobb does it, there's quite a lot. So what I usually do, um, and you guys are absolutely right about what you were alluding to, is um, there's a decent bump when you go from E0 to E10, which I think a lot of people don't realize i think they're more focused on uh all the stuff they read online about how e10 is just uh screwing your fuel economy up really so you you mean there's an actual measurable benefit to the crap we get at the pump there is i mean wow. uh, not a lot of guys remember it because a lot of them that are tuning now weren't tuning when that transition started to happen but e10 actually is a little more knock resistant than e0 um given the same uh, rated octane at the pump. Um, it's a small difference, not huge, but you definitely notice that if you do back to back and you're running something right to the limit. Um, and then as you get up to E30, um, which is a lot, a lot of guys are running, um, if they have fuel systems that they aren't sure are really fully E85 compatible, um, you get a pretty decent bump in performance. And then from what I've seen, depending on the application, somewhere around E60 to E70, uh, so 60 to 70 percent ethanol. Um, whatever timing advance you've been able to throw at it, um, generally speaking, you're not going to want to add much more if ethanol gets higher. Um, same thing with boost. So um, 
some people look at it as a bad thing, uh, but ultimately it's a good thing. You know, when people say they made so and so power, but it was on Winter Blend E85, which might be E65 or something, uh, they're probably not going to make a whole lot more <laughs> on Summer Blend. They uh, unless they kind of pull themselves back, playing it safe. Um, you can do a heck of a lot on uh, on sixty to seventy percent. Hmm. That's pretty cool to, to know that. I didn't know there was any any additional knock resistance in E ten. Yeah. So that that is yeah. Uh, so I really didn't know that. That's pretty impressive. I, <laughs> well, I, I would have never guessed it either. You know, I I never thought that the the literal you know blending of methanol and fuel is as easy as pouring some gas in your tank and then pouring some ethanol in your tank, and then this flex fuel, you know monitor figures it out well that's what i was that's asking a, that's about, amazing that's me. what i was asking about the gradients because like we talked about this with the drag week car depending yep. on if you were going to do try to run the whole thing on 85 yeah. or if you were going to do Pump the switch the fuel, over yeah, and then yeah. okay how much residual do we have in a tank what is the consequence of magnet magnitude if we have right. one gallon of gasoline you know i i was it's yeah. me i'm neurotic and it actually sounds like it's not that that terribly important over 65 percent. i guess once you're up high enough yeah is that that pretty accurate mike that once you're up over say 65 it's not as critical as when you were making your initial changes down low in percentage yeah i mean uh some other tuners might feel a little differently but uh based on my experience and uh talking to some other guys in the industry that i respect a lot we've all seen pretty much the same thing um i mean if you're running like a absolute maxed out drag only car um there's certainly a benefit to having the highest content you can um, but realistically, most guys aren't trying to run their engine an inch of their life to get a single pass out of it. So um, you can easily tune it to be totally safe on uh, E65, like you said. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's good to know. It is very good to know. I think we're still going to have to pump our fuel out, though, because you'll be neurotic <laughs> anyway. I, I would love to know that we could get through the. But you see, like, this. You won't is believe it. No, I, well, you couldn't make yourself believe it. No. And the, the <laughs> other problem is like when you talk to, to people like Mike here that say, well, you know, you get winter blend, it could be 60. And, yeah. and so 85 is really just we're, basically we're throwing shit in there and we don't know how much. No, we're going to pour <laughs> stuff out of the VP can. Yeah. I think that's how that's, it has to be done. Yeah. Just for your mental state. Um, so uh, yeah, what, thing, sorry, go ahead, Mike. Right, go ahead. No, 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 you oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say the, uh, the only thing you guys want to really be mindful of is while 60 to 100 percent might all make about the same power that's only the case if you've got flex fuel so the tune is right for whatever is actually in the engine so the uh the big thing is I, I would definitely suggest whatever system you use that it's got flex fuel so that um the fueling is spot on because you know the timing might be the same between all of those if you tune the car that way but if you don't account for the exact ethanol content in terms of how much fuel inject, um, your air fuel could be off so far that the car just runs like crap. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Um, flex fuel would definitely be the way to go. Well, uh, well, uh, unless we do what we're talking about doing, we're we're, at, we are, we're actually plumbing it so we can drain the tank completely, and we're going to drive it on pump gas and race it on uh, E98. Probably the best thing for us to oh, okay. do to be consistent. Okay. It I mean, that, I mean, it's fourteen hundred horsepower. It's not like a you know. This is not really a. Street. It's not going to make that. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's right. I, wrong heads. I know. We don't have those cathedral port heads. <laughs> nah. Shit. Anyway. Oh god. Um. All right. Well, uh, what, Tad, you got anything? You want to ask him how magic JDM stuff is in Super? Well, I was going to say, you're talking cathedral port heads. I was like, too bad you don't have JDM heads for your LS motors. <laughs> yeah, you'd, Tad, be, you'd be golden. Tad was around all this stuff, and he was one of the guys jumping on mail ordering engines from Japan or whatever the hell he was doing. I don't know. I'm mail ordering. It's off eBay, but anyway. Whatever. So that's a, that's a Subaru thing, I guess. Well, um, this has been great. You got anything else, Mike? Because it's been great for, for me. You know, um, the, the, the problem is, and I, I talked about this before, when you get these guys that are, and, and again, <laughs> I have to reference what Paul Yaw said, yep. you know, when we talked about, you know, having tuners on, <laughs> these are not tuners, these are calibrators. Yeah, he's a calibrator. When, when you get to the point that people are at this level, I, I kind of don't know what to ask because every time I talk to them for a little bit, I end up, I mean, even while we were talking here, I was writing down additional questions, but it's, it's hard because, you know, look, everybody wants to say, well, I've got an LS what's the best ignition timing Yeah. or I've got this, what's my best fuel ratio. And it, 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 it doesn't work that way. And there's, 
I, I don't know. We always struggle with this. We got a half hour, 45 minutes with a guy. How do we have him teach us his knowledge of tuning in a half hour or 45 minutes? Yeah. So the best we can do is come up with questions and then, you know, maybe have the guy back if, if he wants to come back again. Well, hopefully Mike will come back again. He could be one of our go-to. Yeah, I'd love to, you guys anytime. Be one of our go-to calibrator guys. So tell us, uh, tell us what's going on with Cobb. What's uh, what's coming out new? I mean, we talked about flex fuel. Um, you know, tell us what's been going yeah. on there. Yeah, um, we had some cool features uh, that were getting tested at TX2K, uh, which is a big streetcar drag event in Texas. Um, uh, the guys developed a bump box system for the Nissan GTR oh, yeah. where the guys could get the car up on launch control, build full boost when they hit the first beam, and then still be able to walk the car into the second beam in boost. Um, and uh, guys did very well with that. Um, Mike, what controls that? I'm just curious. Like, like what, what locks and unlocks the brakes? Sure. Um, in that case, we're working with not only the engine computer, but the transmission computer in that car, um, remapping both, um, and just allowing the two to talk in a manner that uh, when we release the brake, it doesn't uh, shut the launch control system off. Um, oh, so you literally just pump the brake a little bit with your with your foot to, to bump it in, but it's leaving everything else on. Yeah, you actually have to, uh, we hijack one of the cruise control buttons. Um, so when you're stationary and the cruise control system isn't turned on, um, we use one of the Excel D cell buttons. And if you push that button while on launch control, it allows you to pull your foot off the brake, uh, roll the car forward, get back on the brake. And you take your hand off the button. And when you're ready to launch, you just come off the brake and the car goes. That shit's so cool. So, <laughs> they hijack yeah, and cruise then, control. Uh, yeah, and then we did a similar thing on the EcoBoost Mustang where uh, one of the guys said, you know, well, why do people need to add parts to make a trans brake? All the stuff's there in the factory transmission. We just got to figure out how to take over it. So um, what they did was they made their own trans brake. You don't need any parts for the car. You just flash a tune on it. And, uh, again, we use some of the factory buttons. Um, we've got a burnout mode, so you got a, um, secondary rev limiter that we add, um, which was a factory feature, I believe on the GT, but not on the EcoBoost. We've written our own for the EcoBoost. And then, uh, we give the guys trans brakes so they can launch the automatic EcoBoost Mustangs off of that and, uh, get a better time with the track. How cool is that? I know shit? if you think about this, all the transmissions are solenoid controlled. Yeah. So if you wanted to make the trans think you're in these two gears at once or whatever you're going to do i mean it should well that's all it is right it's Re all reverse and, and first yeah I it think. becomes software logic creativity crazy to make this stuff happen that's i love this stuff i know <laughs> i know you guys are dangerous actually all the cool shit you can do well well listen um give us uh give us a plug for Cobb. you know give us uh give our guys um you know methods to get a hold of you guys yeah, absolutely. Uh, website is Cobb Tuning, C O B B Tuning dot com. Uh, we're in Austin, Texas, but ship worldwide. We got dealers worldwide as well. Um, and uh, if you guys are interested in Ford, uh, Nissan, we got Subaru, uh, Porsche, BMW, Mazda, Evo 10, uh, we've got stuff for all those platforms. And uh, we're working on Volkswagen now as well. So um, if you guys have anything like that, check us out. And uh, if you guys ever have any other tuning questions, um, not just about those things, but anything, um, you know, as you know, Tom, I've got my CTSV, I've done Supers, all kinds of different stuff. So yep. I'd love to work with you guys anytime. Cool. Well, that's fantastic because yeah. this happens every time we do an interview with somebody like this. We sit down and we, Tom and I both have been scribbling stuff on yeah. paper. Yeah. And we're going to end up talking about this. So, yeah, if you're willing to come on again, we'd, we'd love to have you on again. Well, I got sure. a real quick question before we uh, dismiss. Go, Cletus. Any interest in you guys doing diesel? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'd say no, uh, there's two reasons we're probably not going to. The first is it's not really in our wheelhouse. Right. Um, gas engine stock turbo is mostly what we stick to. We do do some um, NA Porsches. Um, but uh, the other big one is uh, a certain company that does diesel tuning uh, made some big boo-boos just blatantly selling.
selling EPF delete kits. Yeah. And uh, they've put the whole diesel tuning industry in the crosshairs. So oh, yeah. I don't think that's something we want to get involved in. <laughs> Good call. Good oh, we call. got all the guys with the stacks out of their beds now. It's I mean, I'm a, I was making fun of Tad, but I mean, my diesel is truly amazing. Yeah, it from, is. From what it is, from what it came to, and then you, you put just some software in it. I know. It's nuts. Nuts. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and speaking of diesels causing uh, trouble, if you guys have Greg Banish on, make sure he tells you the uh, the rolling coal story about the EPA. <laughs> okay. We know we know a little bit about that. Oh, we got him around here. Yeah, so. yeah. Mike's a pro at that anyway. Now, now wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite – my truck is just tuned. Dude, so. you called me one day. You were sitting, <laughs> sitting at a restaurant with a kid on a bike next to you. It's because the guy pissed me off. I know. So I, but- now, look, there's a difference between your truck does it all the time to, you know, just the right place in, in gear-wise and the trans I'll, to jump on. I'll tell you what, though. My father's a bicycler, yeah. and he says on all his blogs are big – there's crosshairs on all the coal rollers for doing that to guys on bikes. Oh, it's just because they're so. nasty. I mean, the bicyclers will be driving down the middle of the road. They'll flip you off when you beep your God forbid. I don't, don't even get me started. Yeah, I'm too old for this we're shit. We're going down the highway now. <laughs> all right, Mike. Well, listen, we appreciate you coming on. You're definitely going to be on again. And, uh, you know, it's good information for our guys and, and great job. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a good night. All right, Thanks. Man. See ya. Dude, cops are real deal. Yeah, yeah, they are. That they're, they're, I know they find a map that you know they can make into something else. Yeah, that, it sounds like they're repurposing areas of the ECU to do the things. Yeah, it's that's just, uh, just badass. That's a hell of a lot farther. So you always talked about like a Cobb access port for yep. your car. Yep. And I, I didn't know, you know, because I'm just I'm not an import guy. Yep. Sorry, you know, like uh, well, well, they make them for other cars other than uh, imports, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's just a a little it's a little handheld tool that. Uh, holds maps for you. You could change maps. I think you can do it even live, on the fly. Live, live said, yeah. Now, yeah. Like on the fly, like you're, uh, and joke. I was going to make a joke that if you modified a Volkswagen, could you ever be in trouble with the EPI? Yeah. I know. <laughs> Cause I you know. already started yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, Not right? the diesel, but <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so, all right, well, we got another, we got another guy hanging. I don't know who this is. Do you? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, his name is Mike and I hope I pronounce this right. His name is Mike Jovanis. Uh, he's actually a customer Anthony's a drag week guy. Okay. And of all things, another guy in the 850, another 850 small class, block huh? power adder. Fantastic. Mike, you there? I am here. Hi, guys. What's up, man? Ah, another day. Anthony told me today, and he wanted me to tell you, that if you would have just turned your boost up, you could have won. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, make sure you tell him that. He's like, just ma- don't let him off the hook on that one. That's what he wanted me to tell you. Anthony got me set up with some better head gaskets this season. So we've been, uh, we've been putting a bunch more boost into it and, uh, not worrying about it. It was the, uh, MLS head gaskets that had us a little worried last year. So what'd you put on a copper? Yeah, we used a new, um, rubber coated copper gasket from flat out performance. We were a little worried about the keeping that you can get with copper with, uh, street driving and heat cycling and everything. And, these things have been fine. You wouldn't even know that they were uh, they were on there. No, no leakage or seepage or anything. They've been good. So what's the car? What's the engine platform? Um, the car is a 1989 Mustang that uh, that's I different. Bought from yeah. <laughs> well, it is a different color, all right? It's a <laughs> it's shadow blue metallic, a very dark blue. Okay. A rare color on a on a Fox body. All right. Um, but yeah, I guess otherwise it's, it looks like a lot of the uh, the other ones. The uh, the motor's an eight feet deck height, uh, three hundred and forty seven cubic inch <clears throat> engine with uh, high ports and a good rotating assembly. Not um not anything crazy. Pretty much parts you could buy off the the shelf. Um, trick flow, R, uh, box upper intake, pretty standard bunch of uh, engine parts. Oh, so this has got like a regular kind yeah. of intake manifold with a box on it. Um, it does. I tend to like the things that are uh, street oriented in terms of fit and finish underneath the hood that use common parts that you could get if something breaks. So um, I think Anthony and I disagree on some of those things sometimes because he just keeps, he wants to shift you to race parts and the things that'll make, make additional power. That intake on my car is only gasket matched to a 1262 um, intake gasket. And I think we've made 1,400 rear wheel horsepower through it with an $80 gasket match. So wow. wow. I think it's doing its job pretty well. Now, the funny thing is this is the first uh, this past year 
is your first thing because we talked earlier. Wait, can I go back for one second? Sure. Sorry. So what heads are these? High ports? Yeah, they are. Um, yes, they're what? trick flow high ports that were done by Fox Lake. What shape are the ports? Ohio. Oh, here we go. Cathedral Lake? Are, are they square? Um, and they're not round. They're like a, yeah, they're like a rectangle shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're rectangle. Yeah. Okay. They're not like, <sighs> yeah. they don't have peaks on them or anything. <laughs> And see, I'm just wondering why you wouldn't have transplanted some Cathedral Port LT LS1 heads on it to really make power. But sorry, that's just me. Go ahead, Mike. Sorry. We've been beating on a on a particular individual, and it's I can see this is not going to go away <laughs> anytime Ever. soon. Ever. Um. But but you and I had a conversation about the reliability aspects and what it takes to make one of these cars work for something like Drag Week. You you said that specifically you weren't changing head gaskets or fixing stuff that broke down you know the engine and trans combination everything worked well and you attributed a lot of that not only to the people that helped you but the way the whole project was deployed so you said cooling fuel system all kinds of things that you've done could you share some of that sure sure um absolutely and yes you are you are correct um both working with uh anthony at the soma racing engines and hughes does my transmissions and converters I sort of have no drama out of either of those things, so it lets lets us focus on what I would consider the harder parts of making something drive on the street regularly. Um, the first one is cooling, and cooling is probably worse on a turbo car. The advantage of a turbo car is it makes a ton of power. The disadvantage is it creates a lot of heat and has a lot of pipes under the hood and a lot of uh, a lot of things going going on. So um, we we have a large uh, aluminum radiator and. A Mazir remote mounted 55 gallon per minute pump that's on the radiator and a big dual fan set up um, from a uh, engine cooling perspective. The, the harder part is probably the transmission because you just create a lot of heat when you're using um, when you're towing trailer. First of all, that's yeah. Th this was this was one aspect I was hoping he was going to bring up. He <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine doing the tuning to make something drive around and now pop a thousand pound item behind you? Yeah, I mean that that does have to drastically yeah. skew anything you could simulate before the trailer was on the back of the car. Yep, I guess it would. Yeah, for sure. So the the cooling, what actually made us really pay attention to transmission cooling is True Street for NMRA and NMCA because you make three immediate back to back passes, and the transmission never really cools down between those passes. So we put um, something that's kind of special on the car after a bunch of learning. We have a Mazir transmission pan that allows you to circulate engine coolant through it. So when the car is off, you can circulate engine coolant by running the electric pump and the electric fans, and it circulates coolant through veins in the bottom of the transmission pan. So when the car is not running, you can um, still pull heat out of the transmission. So for True Street, that works really well um, because even even uh, transmission coolers with fans on them, there's no fluid circulating when the car is off, so they really don't help you when the car is not running. That same pan also helps with drag week because it, it, it equalizes pr uh, the temperature between the engine and the transmission when you're driving as well. Um, you could just take a lot, you get a lot more heat transfer out of um, coolant or water than than you do out of air to air, air to water going through fans, right? And then cooling the transmission fluid directly. So even towing the trailer, we never saw a transmission temp that was over 200 degrees on, on drag week. And that was towing something that's probably, well, you know, over a thousand pounds behind us and a power glide transmission with mm. no overdrive. So you're, you're at a higher RPM than you probably want to be when you get on any sort of road with room on it. Uh, and that, that transmission pan just worked great. It's, it was originally designed for um, bracket cars that needed to heat the transmission up for consistency purposes, and we completely flipped the usage of it, and we use it to cool it down. That's a good idea. Right. Uh, nice. Very good idea. So uh, your plans to uh, same thing this year? Just uh, you redid the motor, and you're going back at it. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the plan this year would hopefully be to win instead of getting second place in that class. But, uh, How, other than that, what was your average last year? My average was an 818, um, after the five, the five days of racing. Wait a minute. You're, you're, wait a minute. 818 or 858? Eight, 818. Oh, then he's not in our class. 
What 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 class were you in? That was a uh, super street small block power adder. Okay, so not the eight fifty class. No, street race is the eight fifty class. Oh, okay. Might get some bad information. Bad info. Not unusual. Yeah, I have a bunch of stuff on my car that makes me not legal for street race. So throwing shit around, making noise. I have to race in super street. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, that that that's encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> So that one less, one less competitor, one less guy. We got it. We're yeah. in because he said second place, and I, and that started me thinking. Because didn't we have somebody on that, that was that finished second? I don't know, dude. It's a blur. We've had a lot of we've had, a lot. We've, had, we've had like nine hundred eight fifty guys. Not on. only that, he's probably in a better class because I think there's probably less people in his class. Dude, this this the eight fifty class is going to be packed. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. Whatever. We're so fucked. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> what All right. Going to take on that. Say what? What are you guys going to take on uh, on Drag Week? What do you mean? What kind of car? Yeah. I don't know. We, we didn't decide yet. We're working <laughs> yeah. on it. Maybe, maybe a Malibu wagon. Maybe a Fox body. Now, we've got a <laughs> 2001 Corvette. So that yeah. you know presents its own set of challenges, for sure. Um, but it's yellow, and, but, it, and it has square port heads. And it is convertible. Yeah. So that it's... Cool factor is there, but I I think we're going to be okay. We got the right people involved in it. Kind of exactly what you said, the the support system behind it all, and how you've done your build. We we've said it on here a million times. When you get people that are trying to make a race car a drive and survive on the street, that's kind of a bad path. You'd rather have a street car that you're trying to make go as fast as you need it to go, and and that's kind of the route that we're taking. So we're going to see. I yeah. I, I think. I don't think we'll have any problem going fast enough. My concern is consistency. Sure. That's my concern, but yep. we'll see. Yep. Got it. Yeah, and a lot of the parts that are designed to support a low eight-second or high seven-second car aren't designed for sustained use on the street. But you also have to watch out for things like fuel system parts and fuel pumps. Um, a lot of those aren't intended for continuous duty use. Um, they can get hot, overheat, and cause you a bunch of problems. So... Um, I have all welded parts on my car and the proper pump controller to turn it down. And we sort of used it exactly per the guidance from Weldon. And we didn't have a hiccup out of that the whole time. And we had guys that were with us that had to frequently stop because of fuel pumps overheating. And I think that's the difference between 30 miles. You may never have a problem. If you drive six to eight hours in 90 degree weather, that's going to find the problem with your, with your fuel system for sure. Yeah. Well, the, the fuel pump side, I mean, And again, this is just me looking at this uh, as a streetcar guy. Most of those pumps that they make, they're not, you know, found in things that are running for hours, are they? No. I mean, mean, now look, if Weldon has some stuff that they say, look, we can run the pump at this speed or we can, you know, it's it's a controlled pump and, you know, it doesn't overheat and it doesn't do anything wrong, that's probably a great piece, but... I was always leaning more towards a, a street type pump, sure. multiples kind of exactly. Yeah, that's what we talked about. In, yeah. in the tank, stay cool. Yeah. But I mean, this is uh, another aspect. What of do it. we know? Yeah. I, the reason why I never did that for true street was because it's additional complexity in the fuel system and complexity has its own evil. So if I have a scenario where there's an easy answer, um, I follow the easy answer as opposed to having a bunch of complexity. Some people have two fuel systems in cars so that they can drive with street street get, street fuel and race fuel. Uh, we just drain the tank and change the fuel every time we got to the track. It makes you smell like fuel a little bit, but it's nice and simple, right? You can't you can't screw up draining the fuel out and putting the other fuel in. It, it works just fine. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, I, yes, I think I, I think I'd be more. I mean, you could certainly get into the situation where you have two dedicated fuel systems and you you know trying to automate stuff. But uh, I'd rather just take the fuel out of damn car for me personally. Yep, talked about that too. Yep, I think so. Yep. Yeah, they sell they sell like a fifteen dollar four gallon oil drain pan that as long as you clean it out and you never use it for oil, it works perfectly for switching fuel. I I'd, I'd probably just use a pump out. I mean, I'd probably just pump it out, wouldn't you? Yeah, we talked about that. Putting a, a T fitting and some kind of, you know, high grade, um, uh, you know, nozzle thing. Ball valve. Yeah, something that we that could just be used yep. just for pumping out. Pump it out, fill it up. Well, have a couple jugs. We got some things to plan. Yeah, we'll be fine. What other things did you run across street versus uh, the your or let's say your racing endeavors versus drag week? Anything else became taxing or became a problem? Yeah, I, I mean, I think tuning is a, is a big thing to, to focus on because 
it's a different ball game when you're towing a trailer. It's also a different ball game when you're using pump gas. Pump gas runs much different in a car like mine than uh, C16 does. So you're almost starting over from a tuning perspective. And it's not one of those things where the tune can be just good enough to get down the road. If you're going to drive it for 68 hours a day for four days straight, you really need it to run right or it will it will drive you crazy. So uh, I spent a bunch of time with a good friend of mine just driving around with the pump gas with the laptop in his lap. And, um, continued to refine sort of what the car liked and didn't like and kind of had to learn how the, the pump gas was different. And then we had to connect the trailer and, and do the same thing all over again. We sort of started with the baseline without the trailer and then had a bunch of people looking at us like we were crazy driving around the neighborhood. <laughs> with the- <laughs> Go back and forth with the trailer connected every, like, what the hell are these guys doing? It just looks completely ridiculous because it's, uh, it's, it, it just, it kind of never stops looking ridiculous, no matter how many times you stare at the, uh, at the car. Um, and we found that having a bunch of timing in the car when you're accelerating worked well, but then the car really calms down and cruises quietly. If you pull, peel some timing back out, um, when you're at like whatever your cruise RPM is and the, um, these, the C16 runs a lot cooler in the car than the pump gas. So the pump gas, the car immediately runs like 15 or 20 degrees hotter. So running the pump gas a little richer while it uses more fuel, it, it keeps the car a little cooler. Again, if you're concerned with the heat that you end up building up because you're you're driving around a high horsepower car. Um, the Haltech engine management system I have allows us to have four dimensional tables. So you can basically take any table that's in the ECU and set it so that based on the position of the knob on the dash, that you you use an alternate table. So we took all the key tables that would affect drivability, added the fourth dimension, and I have a knob on my dash that goes from pump gas to race gas tune. So it makes it super easy. You're not loading files or anything. You get to the track, you turn the knob, and you're ready to go. If you don't mind me asking, what made you pick the Haltech? You know, I probably make decisions sometimes that are on a different path of logic than other people. I put a Haltech in my car about four years ago when nobody even knew who they were in the uh, in the domestic car market. They used to do a lot of work in the import market. I'm a uh, software guy by trade. That's what I do in the day job. So when I took a look at what these guys were doing and what kind of capabilities they were putting in their, their software, um, I just thought it was superior to the systems that, that were um, the alternative at that point. Four years ago, the landscape was a little bit a little bit different. And I've continued to work with those guys now over the last four years. They... They have about 10 guys in Kentucky, and then they have an office in Australia, and they, you automatically get routed to whichever office is open. They almost have 24 by 7 support because of the, the two different offices. Um, the support is just excellent, and they continue to do cool new stuff uh, from a software perspective. So I've been really happy with, uh, with them. And uh, since then, in the last four years, you see a lot of those systems in, in cars now. It's definitely changed a lot over that time period. Gotcha. Cool. That's very good. Cool. I was wondering what made him use a Haltech. Yeah. Because that's, they're they're not, and I'm not knocking them. I'm not picking on them no, at all. No, you don't hear it a lot. No, you don't hear it a lot. And the same thing, like if you heard a guy, you know, like a regular conventional quarter mile drag guy uh, using, say, a Motec, you know, it seems like expense and complexity mm-hmm. keep some of these guys back. Yep. But yeah, that's, that's interesting stuff. Yeah. Cool. All right. So yeah. you're all set to go. Are you ready or ready or no? Uh, I actually am ready right now, believe it or not, until I break five things between now and September, which will probably happen. <laughs> um, right now, we're just trying to get the car to go faster. Um, the copperhead gasket, like I said, allows us to – we used to stay at about 28, 28.5 pounds of boost last year. Uh, we've made almost 34 pounds this year with a 94-millimeter turbo and the, the better head gaskets. Um, so that put us back into the mode of changing stators in the converter and – getting all the other variables right with the increased power. So um, I'd like to be able to pull off um, seven-second average, um, both in True Street and in, in Drag Week. So we're trying to do all the testing to get us there. Awesome. All right. Well, I mean, uh, Anthony's a great engine builder. You're yep. in good hands. Good friend. Yeah, no doubt about it. Makes me feel good to hear that Anthony's, uh, you know, got, got a good He's reputation with this branching stuff. branching out, yeah. Yeah, good yep. for him. Yep. All right, Mike. Well, listen, man, we appreciate it. We wish you the best of luck. Even more now that you're now not in our not class. class. Yeah, hell yeah. 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 <laughs> Hope you win it, buddy. We'll, we'll see you out there. All right, yeah, we'll make sure to catch up out there. Take care. No guys. doubt. Thanks, man. See ya. Okay, bye.
Well, unless person you got to work to watch out for yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. not Kevin's fault. He probably got you know something a little crossed up here because like it's everybody you talk to is in eight fifty. Yeah, yeah. Like everybody. That's all right. No, that's that's good. But he, you know, I mean, some of the things he said had made a lot of sense. Yeah, they cross over. Yeah, because if, if you're going to do your tuning for street drivability, mileage, everything else, and then you pop the trailer on the back. It's got to put you in an entirely different load section of the fuel map. We got to have a Holly guy on running a parachute. I, I, I think you. that's I think that's where they uh, where they self learn. Yeah, I think I don't know. We got to we'll we'll tell well it's, it's we're in the tuner series, so we'll we'll get to it. Okay, all right. Um, we should plug the the shows again. Sure. Yeah. I'm sorry we didn't get you guys in too often, uh, too much. But uh, yeah, these guys run the Custom Show Emirates. Uh, you can follow them at at Custom Show Emirates on um, on Instagram. And, uh, we glad we had you guys. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. but, uh, just too much stuff going on. We'll, we'll get you next time you're around. You'll be able to talk more <laughs> and next week. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'd like, I mean, honestly th- to have people from different countries to discuss the car side of things. From sure. America, that's amazing. Yep. I mean, like Tom tells me all the time, he talks about that. What's big over there is, I guess the, the thing you had me call on, uh, sand rail yeah, stuff. Sand drags. Yep. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, are these guys, they really have like 2,400 horsepower? More. Yeah. More. 4,000. 4,000. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. I I, I can't even understand. Is, Dude, is, they, have, they have top alcohol, you know, dragster engines in these things. Yeah. That they buy here. Like Brad Anderson stuff, and it's crazy. Yeah. That's they, absolutely amazing. I got no problem with that. Fat music engine. Yeah. Is, um, is, does the sand... Act like um, they have paddle tires. Yeah, so I was gonna say it's, it's like a kind, torque converter. Yeah, it's is it like yeah. is it like running in sand? Like it's hard to run in sand, so it's yeah, hard to yeah. make the car move in sand. Too? And, yeah, dude, it throws sand three hundred feet behind the car. Right, I mean right. It, it's crazy, and the dune buggies too. You know, twelve hundred, fourteen hundred oh, horsepower yeah. dune buggies that'll they'll wheel stand on demand. Driving across the desert, you lay in the throttle and they'll wheel stand. Really? Yeah. And I don't know how fast they go. I mean, they, they, I, they got to go hundred over hundred miles an hour, right? Yeah. It depend, uh, depends on that road. Yeah. But it's crazy flying all over. They got the big flags sticking up so you could see them from the other side of dunes. So yeah, they, you know, crash into each other. Yeah. Oh yeah. Boy, that could be bad, huh? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And I mean the light systems and the L- LCD LED dashes and it's crazy. It's, you know. They have their fun over there, man. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, they do. I really like to get there for the show. I, oh, I think you have to come. Yeah, you should come. I, I think the show would be a lot of fun. It would be. You'd enjoy it. We'll work something out. Yeah. So what else? That's Anything? It. That's it. We're good. Another one in the books. I guess so. Well, listen, it was great having you guys here. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry there's not much more to talk about. No, I no mean, it's okay. Is there anybody you guys want to say, say hi, hi to, to or yeah. plug or say uh, anything? Just... Uh, say like uh, that the cooperation that it's happening between uh, us and uh, our area it is very good because you are the manufacturer and we are uh, the end users so it is a good partner we can say between the manufacturer and uh, those things and we are glad that our uh, prince he met uh, donald trump yeah (laughs) <laughs> and he's uh, today they meet each other and they give some good numbers also that uh, 38,000 of uh, US brands is uh, selling in UAE and uh, 676 officially registered and the trade also it is uh, more than 27 uh, to 28 billion dollar between mm-hmm. our uh, country only UAE and us and uh, of course uh, after market parts one of the things between uh, from those things sure and uh, i think it will grow more and more and uh, we was in lucas oil and they are uh, thinking to open a branch there or to keep their uh, stock for middle east uh, orders there uh, they want to be near than uh, their uh, their dealers also uh you know and the show is a good opportunity for those companies who's uh, manufacturing and uh, to have a new market or to have research and development to understand to be near than their customer from that side to understand what they want what type of cars what 
type of races that it is suitable to them to pr- produce something to them. Uh, from my experience through my company, Top Speed Performance in UAE, we got a lot of, uh, we grow uh, the things that uh, the company is there. The market and overall, it is growing faster than U.S. because U.S. is adult market is finished. Uh, like, uh, but there, no, it is like the passion is increasing. The things is more and more, and uh, the type of race is also getting more. A lot of circuit getting in, like in Kuwait in 2018 or end of 2017, there will be a drug strip, which mm. it will help this industry also to grow more and to sales. How has growth been percentage-wise, say, over the past couple of years? Is it really picked up? Uh, for me, it was like 20%. Really? Yeah. Just like we can say like 2016, you know, the industry over, all over the world, it was like um, not very good, to be honest. But it uh, didn't decrease like other sectors like real estates and banks and other things. Well, I'll tell you, I I know Saeed for a long time, and he um he not only pushes his own his own company top speed, but he really is like a steward for the performance business in the UAE. He he helps anyone that needs help promoting their business. Uh, doesn't matter what country, you know, and anywhere over there, they know who this guy is because he's passionate about the the automotive racing industry. Mm-hmm. That's what he loves, and he's he's very good at it, promoting it. And um, does a great job. Everybody knows what it, what he does and what a great job he does. Fantastic. Yeah. Is uh is it hard to deal over there? Like for a U.S. company, like how hard is it for them to get involved in selling to the Middle East? Uh, it is not uh, very difficult. Uh, they have to come to there to understand the market mm-hmm. through their visit. They will see by their eyes. It is better than only hear through emails or read or just. Uh, they have to visit the shops uh, to see uh, the workshops uh, to see some races based on this they can uh, make a good strategy for their sailing to their or r&d also mm-hmm. they can easy involved in it uh, and uh, the people there are very friendly tom you know yes absolutely. and they are uh, they like uh, us people they are most appreci- uh, will come anytime and appreciate it, and they will have a lot of fun. They can go to desert with them. They can have a full sheep, and uh, uh, they eat with them, and uh, a lot of things uh, they can do there. And uh, beside the business, uh, the type of race is a little different. From market to market, it is a little different. Like you can say in Kuwait, they don't have dunes and those things. Uh, in UAE, all sand things, uh, so the cars like uh, 80% tuned like uh, Camaro, Mustang, those cars in Kuwait. But in UAE, when you will go like uh, all uh, off-road things like uh, tracks more for U.S. vehicles or uh, Nissan Safari and Land Yeah, the Cruiser. Nissan Patrol, right? Patrol, Is that what yeah. we're talking about? Those oh, yeah. things are nuts. Yeah, everybody owns one. <laughs> I think Saeed's the only guy I know that doesn't own one, right? You don't have, you, do you have a patrol? No, I am your guy, Jochen. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, got a, he's got a GMC, that's right. <laughs> yeah. But everybody else in Dubai owns at least one patrol, I think, because that's all you see over there. Now, that, those things never came here, right? No, they come now. The, the, there's two versions of the patrol. Yeah. There's like the Q56 Infinity patrol, and there's also the, is there a, what's the designation of the inline six? The, the Yeah, uh, TB48. The TB48. Yeah. So they have a shorter, like a Jeep type version, and that's what they race. That's they're all over the place. Is that the thing that was on? What was it? Top Gear? Yeah, with they, the, yeah, 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 they, yeah, they made a GTR exactly. out of it. Yeah, you yep. got it. That's the one. <laughs> Could you imagine that ruining your day? It's bad enough to get beat by things you didn't think, but then that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's a full on GTR that looks like a like a Jeep. <laughs> yeah. You Pretty. know, we are getting like from uh, police now, uh, Abu Dhabi police. Uh, we get orders through our uh, one of our client they want to tune like 100 car for police for supercharge really? and uh, yeah. headers and filters kit and like this yeah now just they order for eight cars after that they are going until 100 yeah that's crazy and well first time i was there i was amazed to see that the police in dubai had bmws yeah except for the 
the higher up guys had even cooler cars. I forget what some of them were, but yeah, like Aventador, they have yeah, yeah, yeah. Ferrari, Lamborghini, they have yeah. Mercedes, police, car, uh, police cars. So wait a minute, yeah, Bentley, they have uh, Rolls Royce for uh, like, <laughs> as a police officer. <laughs> yeah, as yeah, a police, we're in a wrong job. <laughs> we definitely are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know, sometimes they do like parade and the uh, police ladies driving those fancy yeah. cars. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Could you imagine somebody in the U.S. saying, hey, Mr. Congressman or whatever, we need a pair of those Aventadors for yeah. a high-speed unit. Yep. Oh, my <laughs> yep. God. He'd have you locked up <laughs> and, for being and, stupid. And the commissioner gets a Bentley. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's crazy. Well, that's good. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I'd really like to go visit the show. I've talked to Tom about it, you know, the couple times he's he's gone. And uh, and it, every time he comes back, he says it's a blast. He says he loves going over there. I, I guess the worst thing about it is the time change. You come back and you're messed up for like yeah. a week. Yeah, when you come back. <laughs> yeah. I think next time you have to come and uh, broadcast your uh, radio from there. Yeah, well, I, don't, I mean, probably we, all that stuff could be done. Sure. Why I don't not? see why not. We could do it. Yeah. We could do it. Awesome. I'll be calling in for that one. So, (laughs) well, you don't talk a hell of a lot to begin with, so it don't matter. He's been here five minutes and said more than you have the whole time you've been sitting there. (sighs) Anyway, (laughs) he's our technology guy. All right. Fantastic. Well, listen, again, it was great having you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much. uh, No, a lot of fun. And I I love hearing about it. And uh, look, if you're a United States company, you know, that's something you should think about. Absolutely. I mean, it's definitely an opening market and there are a lot of opportunity for sure. Yep. And if you're going to go over there and do something, you've got to display its custom show. Yep. Right? No doubt. Take a booth. All Thank right. Thank you so much. No problem. You're more than welcome. All right. Well, anything else? Anybody got anything? No. We'll be back again next week. We don't know. Who is it going to be next week? Because that's still up in the air. Yeah, it's up in the air. It's definitely, but, it's going to be somebody good, but. But now we've got like Shane T. We've got a whole bunch of things yeah. in the works. So, yeah. I don't know. This is going to get a little confusing. That's but all right. We'll, we'll figure, figure it out. out. Yep. yep. All right, guys. We'll see you next Monday. Thanks. Later.